Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Film Club Podcast, where every month we deep dive into a different aspect of cinema. Directors, actors, franchises, or genres, it's always fun at the Film Club. I'm Dean. I'm Boo. And this month we're talking about westerns, and this week we're talking about... Tombstone. That's right, Tombstone, coming out in 1993, starring Kurt Russell, Val Kilmer, directed by George P. Cosmatos, supposedly, we'll get into that one. Yeah, we will. But yeah, we are rounding out Western Month, and the best way to cap it off before our bonus is to do what people say is the best of the 90s Western Revival. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's, like, the 90s Western Revival was, like... Dances with Wolves, uh, Unforgiven, Tombstone. Uh, You get, like, Quigley Down Under, I think, a little later than this, maybe, like, the year after. Wyatt Earp came out, like, right after this one. Yeah. But yeah, the 1990s kind of kicked off the Western revival after the 80s pretty much killed the genre as a mainstream box office thing. Yeah, because the 80s was all about the blockbuster. Yeah, and I think the closest you really got was like Clint Eastwood movies like High Plains Drifter, but I don't think that was even a giant box office smash. Yeah. Uh, but this these were, for yes, the most part. very like, much. But yeah, we're talking about Tombstone. When was, I guess, the, the first time you saw it, last time you saw it? Oh, that's an easy question, because the first and the last time I saw it was the same time. Oh. So, it was in the 90s. I like how you say, in the 90s. Long decade, could have been any time, it was somewhere in there. I was conscious, so I'm I'm assuming either mid to late 90s. Okay, okay, narrowing it down there. I, my parents were still married, if that helps. Okay, okay narrowing it down even <laughs> yes. more now. Okay, okay. So, did you just never go back to it for, like, like did you just not like the movie? Did you not remember enjoying the movie? Or did you just not care for it? I remember, you know, from way back then, enjoying it. But I remember it feeling like a really long movie. And, you know, it's come on TV, obviously, you know, since the 90s. But it's always been a thing where when I've seen it on TV, it's either in the middle or the ending of the movie. And I like to see a movie from start to finish. So it's just one of those things where it's like, oh, well, I'm not going to actively search the movie. It it was never one of those movies where you were like, I should go back and rewatch Tombstone. It was, that was pretty good for when I saw it at home when I was a kid. Yeah, and, you know, I think it was more like the timing of the movie felt like, yeah, it was a good movie. Yeah, I'd like to see it again, but <sighs> over two hours, I don't know if I want to, you know... I want to put in the the time to watch it, even though it does have Val Kilmer. And I do love me some Val Kilmer. And he kills it in this movie. Oh, yes. It's like, I forgot how good he is in this movie. Oh, yeah. He has an... Val Kilmer has a very insanely meteoric rise from, like, 1990 to, like, 96, I think. Uh, Because I think it's, like, from The Doors to The Saints, Mm -hmm. which is his, like, big starring years. And this is probably his best performance in those years i think people remember this movie because of al kilmer's doc holiday Mm -hmm. uh because like the rest of the cast is star-studded you know we have we have kurt russell in here playing the lead as wyatt Earp, but i think even he is trying to play down because he knows like no one's stealing val kilmer's uh scenes at all there's no way yeah but um i wanted to mention something because you did say that It felt long, or you remember it being long? Well, I mean, you know, at five, six years old, two hours obviously feels like a long movie. And coming around this time, it's two hours, ten minutes. And for me, it felt kind of like a flu. Really? I mean, I did have to watch it on freebie, so I did get some commercial breaks during it. But still, it felt like it moved fairly fast. That's interesting, because I felt it, it actually dragged. Which is, you know, kind of weird. We switched today. Usually the movies drag for me and for you, you know, it's a good burn. And today you're just kind of like, oh my God. Well, it I think it comes down to, I felt the directorial um, behind the scenes conflicts going on watching the film. Yeah. Um, And well, you know what? Let's get into that. But let's tell everyone what the movie's about first. We got the back of the box. We have the back of the box. That you wrote on parchment. 
Uh, and yes. then dyed it to look like, you know, it's from the 1800s. You you guys would love to see my notebooks I write everything in. They are scrolls. It's hilarious. And very authentic to the time periods of what, what these movies are. Indeed. But the back of the box of Tombstone. <clears throat> Wyatt Earp is a retired lawman from Dodge City looking to find his fortune in Tombstone, Arizona by going into business with his brothers Virgil and Morgan as well as their close friend and degenerate gambler Doc Holliday, but the town is overrun by the gang called the Cowboys, forcing the men to take up the mantle of lawmen to bring order to Tombstone. Things get serious after a deadly shootout at the OK Corral, when the Cowboys seek revenge resulting in Virgil losing the use of his arm and the death of Morgan, causing Wyatt and Doc to go on a quest of revenge on the Cowboys, leaving bodies and blood in their wake. And great mustaches and funny lines abound. Lots of mustaches. Lots of funny lines. Lots of funny lines. But as we were saying, this movie for me feels like a compromised vision of like three different people. The the yeah. three supposed directors of the film. Yeah, because I mean, I was trying to think, you know, before I did any research or watch the movie, I'm like, well, who directed this? And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to look. And then I was watching the movie and I'm like, I really can't pinpoint who directed this. Like when you watch a movie and you're like, oh, you could tell this is a Spielberg movie. You could tell this is a Stanley Kubrick, a Tarantino movie. Yeah, because where's like where's the autorist vision? Mm-hmm. Where's like some signature shots? Is there like what's the feel, the theme of the movie that stands out? And it's just kind of not all there. Yeah, and it comes from the fact that the behind the scenes of this is the writer Kevin Jar. He was originally the director for this. Okay. Um, he also wrote movies like Cobra, and I believe he wrote one of the Rambo films. I might not be 100% on that. Yeah, because wasn't it Stallone that suggested that Kevin Jar direct this movie? No. Uh, we'll, we'll get when Sly comes into this. Okay, all right. Because the behind the scenes of this is as fascinating as what is on screen. So Kevin Jar, his passion project was doing Tombstone, this grand epic of the Western, and he wanted it to be, in his words, the godfather of the Western. Mm -hmm. Kurt Russell read Kevin Jar's original script, which, from what I understand, was like a three-hour grand sprawling epic. Yeah, it was supposed to be an epic. Then, when Kevin Jar is like, all right, I'm going to direct the movie, it's going to be my debut feature, they get like a month into shooting, and the producers are like, where's all the fucking coverage? where's why is it that you're a month over budget and a month over schedule and we have like two fucking scenes it's because kevin jar was afraid the producers were going to take it away from him Mm -hmm. so he was very slow and tried to make sure that everything he shot they couldn't cut shit out yeah which slowed production down and they they kicked him off the project anyway and then they were like we're gonna get in a new director they asked sylvester stallone sylvester stallone was like no they asked George Miller. They said no. They asked John McTiernan, the director of Die Hard and Predator. And he said, I'll do it if you give me two two months of prep work so I can get the film done. And they said no. So they got George P. Cosmatos that Sly Stallone suggested because okay. he did Rambo 2 and he did Cobra and Sly worked with him before. But the reason he suggested Cosmatos was because he knew that Kurt Russell wanted to direct the movie, but he didn't feel ready to do that Mm -hmm. and cosmatos was a good yes man okay technically cosmatos is the named director of the film but generally everyone says that kurt russell is the one who actually directed the movie by giving cosmatos all the shot lists and he's the ghost director yeah he's the ghost director which you can kind of see because a lot of the a lot of the shots in the movie aren't very exciting it's it's very standard action um filmmaking yeah. for the most part and then all the dialogue stuff is very master shot coverage coverage and that's it you know we're just doing a lot of singles and a one wide master so the movie has this very weird like journeyman style direction that doesn't make me look at it and no one jumps out as being like whose vision is this yeah because it doesn't feel like russell's because russell's still giving a lot of like the composition a lot of the tools to cosmatos it doesn't feel like cosmatos because he's not very interested in the material and it's not kevin jars because they chopped up his script as soon as he left Mm -hmm. so i don't know very interesting behind the scenes of this yeah i don't know if you saw this when you were researching the movie there was another director that almost 
took on the reins for this movie but didn't. Oh, really? And that was Mr. John Carpenter. Oh, really? Yeah, that would have been interesting. John Carpenter's Tombstone. I, actually, that would have been because he was... He, this was 93, so I think he was on his way to doing, like, vampires. Because I think he was still, like, good enough in Hollywood they would have brought him on to do something, right? Yeah, because Starman was, what, the 80s? Starman, Yeah, Starman was, like, 85, 80, 86. Uh, he had already done, like, Big Trouble in Little China in 88. And I think he did Memoirs of an Invisible Man in, like... 91 so i was like i could totally after seeing starman like i could totally see him taking on the reins of this movie with three brothers and you know just seeing this family fall apart and just the emotion and the anger and the rage that was going on and i also think that a carpenter would have been great because carpenter is a very he knows how to set a scene. He does know how to set a scene. I think that's what I'm going for. Like, he he's, I was going to say, like, he's a great auteur for this, but he also has, like, journeyman sensibilities. Like, he, you know, comes from the cloth of Howard Hawks, where he just shows up and does the fucking work. Like, he knows how to make, compose good shots. He knows how to construct good tension. He can just get the job done. I just keep thinking of that opening from A Solid Precinct 13. And I was like, I could totally see that being incorporated into this movie. And I think that's the thing, you know, um... The director, Cosmatos, he's an action director from that from the cloth of, like, 80s, mm-hmm. you know, muscle-bound, um, you know, meathead shoot-em-ups. Carpenter is from a more, like, gritty kind of um, slow burn. Like, like, Escape from New York mm-hmm. is an action movie, but the action's very sparse out. It's yeah. more like a, an, an, uh, it's more like an atmosphere kind of thing. But with Tombstone... That was the first thing that I noticed after the movie was done was I didn't feel like there was a vision on screen. I felt like there was a good story and there were great actors involved, but I didn't feel like that artistic um, like bite to the movie. Yeah, I mean, it has to be because there were so many hands trying to get the movie made. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I still feel like this is a really good movie. Um, I love, you know, using old footage from the past and, you know, incorporating okay, these are the communities from uh, the gold mining days and, you know, there's lots of money being discovered. People are, you know, starting to get rich. Now we have cowboys and the cowboys are kind of like the police. But at the same time, there's, you know, still tension with the cowboys and... The actual law. The actual law. So it's like, it's an interesting concept. And, you know, having them come into town and seeing, you know, how their journey just to... Basically, we want to retire and live a normal life isn't possible for them yeah and i think that's what's cool about the movie is that it is a very classical western story you know these retired gun these retired lawmen come into town trying to settle down but they just can't they get pulled back in because there needs to be justice uh, everywhere and they got to stand up for what's right kind of thing and with sam elliott how can he not be the law it's like of that, course that man tells you to do something you do it like, look at that mustache how can say no to that mustache <sighs> it's a glorious mustache indeed but that's the thing it's a classic western story with this 90s slickness edge mm-hmm. to it because this is what i felt about tombstone it's a great middle ground between the John Wayne adventure, no blood westerns, and like a Sergio Leone really action heavy, bloody, um, mm-hmm. shoot 'em up kind of western. Like it's a good middle ground between adventure and grit. Yeah, and it, that that's where a really good place for this to to line up with, like a true adventure. <laughs> sure no, not true grit fully but you know yeah not, not true grit but it's like a true adventure you know i i just really think that tombstone fits that really clean niche because mm-hmm. it's not super bloody and gory like something like a bone tomahawk is but it's not so like clean and sterilized like something like stagecoach mm-hmm. uh was you know there's there's like blood there's real like like bad things going on it doesn't feel like we're in a back lot it feels like well, okay we're in like a real west we're in the desert yeah yeah but we're not seeing people's heads exploding or nothing which is you know nice for the kids yeah but we mentioned something else earlier about the movie and probably why the movie works so well it's not just the niche it lands in it's the performances mm-hmm. namely 
the great Val Kilmer performance yes. at the center of this, the, where he steals every scene he's in. He's so charismatic. Why the fuck did he not win like an, a supporting actor Oscar in this? So charming. He's beautiful. But um, apart from that, I uh, just... Apart from your your uh, secret crush on Val Kilmer, a young oh, Val Kilmer. Oh, it's not a secret. Yeah, that crush is, you know, that crush has been there. But uh, recently, I did watch a documentary called Val. Oh, you uh, you actually watched it? Yeah, you know, I, I think I told you, you know, it was really good. Ended up really enjoying it. Because um, I haven't gotten a chance to see it, so I'm very excited to watch it. No, no, no. You got to watch it. I mean, it makes you a little sad just to see, you know how things ended for him mm-hmm. but i mean he's still there he was still in top gun maverick you know it's like he's he, he's still keeping on keeping on he's keeping on keeping on and i hope he continues to do so because he's such a talented actor but what i thought was fascinating from the biography or the documentary was that he's always been into like documenting things mm-hmm. so that's a big you know part of the documentary is that for years on all his projects he would bring his actual camcorder with him and he would record behind the scenes stuff while making movies. And there's, you know, a good amount of footage from Tombstone just hanging out on set, talking to Kurt Russell. And it's just like, you know, Val Kilmer's already an interesting guy. And, you know, he just really throws himself into these roles and he, you know, learns who the characters are. He becomes the characters. He makes these characters iconic. But he's just, he's so cool. What is it that makes his performance so good? Because there's been a lot of Doc Holidays. Lots of Doc Holiday movies, but it's just, you know, he's supposed to be the gambler, you know, the, the gunslinger. And I think just because Val Kilmer's already a cool guy, he's really able to emulate that, you know, I need to be slick and fast at the same time and smart to, you know, outwit these people and, you know, basically take all their money. Well, it's, it's interesting because you bring up that fact of Val Kilmer brings that natural cool charisma Mm -hmm. to the screen i mean because he was in uh top gun right the original top gun in like what was that like 87 80 it's it it was like 80 something right that was somewhere i think it's the late 80s yeah and like oh tom cruise became you know a uh, mega star and they're like oh it's tom cruise he looks you know he's all cool and stuff but the whole premise of tom cruise is he's the coolest lame guy in every movie yeah and val kilmer I, is a chameleon yeah like val kilmer i think is a is a very different actor in everything he's been in like his his star making performance that made him like oh this guy's not just like a pretty face he's a great actor is the doors, doors yeah. right with um him playing jim morrison if you guys haven't watched that highly recommend it if you want to hear about it we do have an episode about it oh yes we do oh shit but the thing is you know that's his star making performance in like 91 mm-hmm. right then i feel like Every performance he has after that, you get him in like Batman Forever, mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, you know, he's he has that same sort of like I'm cool and kind of nothing, you know, phases me yeah. persona, and I think that's the persona he has. And in this, it works so well because Doc Holliday just feels like that kind of guy, like nothing scares him. He doesn't care what's going on. He's at death's door, but he's going to continue to avenge his friends. Uh, i mean it's kind of funny because i don't think doc holiday really cares all that much about anyone other than wyatt i don't think he cares that much about like virgil and morgan but he really likes wyatt well yeah i mean they grew up together they're friends but you know wyatt's his best friend and his best friend is hurting and it's kind of like you know i'll be there for you it, it, it's a it's a bromance it's a bromance and it's like how can you not be there for your best friend when your best friend's in need and has to go avenge it's kind of interesting you know because i don't know if you noticed this so you know the um the actress character what what's her name why it's love interest oh oh my god i forgot what her name is so, yeah that's that's going to be a big problem coming up in this because all the female characters just are almost non-essential to what's going on I don't think they make a point of saying that they're not like traditionally married. It's more like a common law, you know, kind of marriage. So I'm not sure, you know, what the whole deal is with the three blondes. Yeah. But the actress, um, Josephine, who's who's played by Dana Delaney. Yeah. Yeah. So Josephine, that's that's the name I was looking for. 
Josephine, she's like, oh, I just want to travel and I don't want to be held down by anything. And I want, I to, want to travel and have room service, which is like, honey, I understand completely. Exactly. But it's interesting that Wyatt's, the woman that Wyatt is so attracted to and is going to leave his wife for and all this other stuff gives off Doc Holiday vibes of mm-hmm. being like, nothing phases me. The world's a place to be explored and have fun and yada, yada, mm-hmm. yada. And I'm like, does is does Wyatt Earp just really want to just like be with Doc Holiday, but he but like that shit's just not gonna fly in like eighteen eighty something? Maybe. I don't know. It's also Val Kilmer, so who could <laughs> not want to be with him? Sure, sure, sure. I mean he does look like he's about to drop dead in every scene he's in. He does, but then he surprises you and you know, he's got the guns out and it's just like, damn, you're at death's door, but you still got it. <laughs> but it's just, you know, these little things that make the character feel real you know even down to uh the southern aristocratic accent which you were trying to do in the car (laughs) yeah i i can't uh i can do like a southern accent but it's all hillbilly southern um (laughs) but yeah because the thing is val kilmer just feels so i'm i'm trying to come up with a good way to uh to quantify it right because the reason i think this movie is so remembered and so beloved is because of that val Kilmer performance and because he just empties everything into it right there's yeah. no um art it doesn't feel like there's any artifice to it everyone else in the scenes also kind of play down they're like like um kurt russell in all the scenes he has with val Kilmer's doc holiday he's very kind of like quiet you know Mm -hmm. he's you know he's playing you know intense looks and you know man a few words while he's letting val kilmer just use that giant vocabulary to tear down all these idiots in the room and it it really does feel like the whoever the director was knew that val kilmer was going to be the breakout character of this dog holiday was so they just kind of let him do his thing whenever he was on screen yeah because i mean he really does his homework to become these people, I mean, including, you know, the accent. I want to go back to that because apparently Doc Holliday was cousins, I guess seven generations removed, however that works, with Margaret Mitchell, who was the author of Gone with the Wind. Mm, So, you know, it's this thing where it's just like, you know, any talented person that can, you know, do accents could go in and give a Western accent, but he knows these little details and it's like, this is going to make the character feel more authentic wasn't it like also a thing like people speculate and i think even she mentioned that rhett butler is very loosely based on doc holiday like story yeah. she heard about him yeah that's that's stuff that i've heard too so it's just this interesting kind of tie into the universe of movies and actual historical things that happened because the movie is supposed to be based on real events real people all that stuff and some of it's like really accurate and there's also a lot of stuff that just seems like it's total movie bullshit. And it's like, yeah. no, that's real. And then some stuff where you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. And it's like, well, that's because the script got cut down. Because there's things like Wyatt Earp, you know, near the climax where he's going out and he's going to shoot the, the cowboy in the river, right? And you're like, oh, this is such movie bullshit. Why can't anybody hit him? And it's like, no, because that, that actually happened. That was real. And that was just like the most shocking thing. Because that was such a cool scene to watch. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, you understand that Wyatt has basically lost everything. Yeah. And it's just like, I've got nothing to live for. My best friend's dying. My brother's gone. And my other brother, he's going to be okay. But he's not going to be the same as he was before. And it's just this moment where, you know, all the bullets are missing him. And I'm like, that's total movie magic where, you know, we've got our hero. How does and a guy 10 feet away from you miss three rounds in a row exactly. as you're walking up on him? And then he just blows him away in the water and he goes down the river. And I was just like, whoa. And the fact that, no, that is actually historically accurate and happened. And it's not like a thing where, like, oh, yeah, Wyatt Earp told us after he showed back up to town, like, a week later. No, it's like there's 12 guys who were like, no, that shit fucking happened. Yeah. He's a bad motherfucker. Yeah, and it was one of those guys, you know, that went and told the story before he passed away. He was like, I was there, you know, I was shot too, and, you know, it blew my mind. Dead. You know, end scene. Yeah, I mean, and and there's things like that where... The movie is playing with, like, real historical stuff, like, oh, shoot out the OK Corral, where it's like, oh, yeah, this big famous gunfight. And it's like, OK, yeah, that's cool. You know, that's historically accurate. And then there's stuff like 
um Wyatt Earp's uh wife who has like a laudanum addiction which yeah. is real an opium addi- addiction yeah yeah I mean that kind of threw me because I wasn't expecting that that's something I didn't remember from the movie but, like you know oh this was you know prescribed for menstrual crabs really <laughs> opium like yeah wow. you used to just be able to take 10 percent pure heroin and just drink that back for a cough <sighs> wow medicine used to be wild <laughs> But I bring this up because he has his wife, Natty, uh, Maddie, something, something like that. I think it was Maddie. Maddie. She has, like, this opium addiction, which is, like, true to, like, historical fact or whatever. But she dies, like, I think way before any of this shit happens. Like, I think, she, I think like, she's either dead right before or right after the OK Corral thing. Like, she, like, dies of a um, opium overdose. And it's during the, the last monologue of the movie when they're... Um... When they're dancing in the snow, him and Josephine, and and you're just like, wait, isn't isn't he married? And then the narrator's like, and his wife Maddie died four years ago of a drug overdose. It's like, oh, okay, thank you, but wait, wait, four years ago? What no, year is this? It, it was um, she dies two months, I guess, after the OK Corral when you know when she walks away from him, you know, yeah. when when it's raining and everything. Also. I love that scene and the symbolism in that scene. I, I love the fact that if you go 10 feet away from the rain, you can see everywhere else on set is completely dry. Well, yeah, you know, movie magic. <laughs> I love it. But it's like, yeah, I, I like that they kind of, you know, made sure, you know, it was cool that they, you know, ended up together and lived their lives together and, you know, died together and were buried together. But I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, like, it's funny how the movie is like, okay, all the cool action shit that's historically accurate, we're keeping that shit in. But having Wyatt be there when his wife dies, now nah, we're brushing. That's not in the movie. That's not relevant. Yeah. And I'm like, that's so weird to me because I feel like then why did you have the wife character? Because she serves almost no purpose to the rest of the movie. Yeah, I, I guess it's just there to kind of show, you know, this is who we used to be. And we're settling down now because, you know, my wife's having this drug issue and the headache issue i i don't know if they were i was trying to figure it out if they were saying you know the headache thing could be something more severe or it's just she's hooked on the opium and it's kind of you know tearing them apart a bit it it's it's weird because it's like there's a it's a subplot of like a relationship drama in my action western movie but they never explore it yeah, that and that happens kind of a few times in this. You know, mm-hmm. we have that we have like the the whole B plot thing going on with like the Fabian played by Billy Zane. Also, Billy Zane's in this. I was so surprised when we walked out. I'm like, this is like um, season two of Twin Peaks when you don't know who else is going to keep you know making cameos in this show. And you're like, fucking Billy Zane's here, and it's like, okay, Billy, and it's around the same time. Exactly. Yeah, and it's like, okay, fucking Billy Zane's here as the fucking theater guy, and then you have like curly bill's friend who was like really into billy zane yeah and there's like an implication that he is like sexually attracted to him and then it's never followed up on he, you it's also like two have scenes you also have jason Priestley from 90210 uh you have michael roker from the walking dead i was just like oh my god there's so many people in this cast which is insane but again it's like this cast is sprawling of like real named actors that i feel like had much bigger parts at some point because michael rooker's character is supposed to have this whole thing where he was with the cowboys and then he's like i ain't about this about killing no lawman and leaves and he has a character arc and it's it's not even about killing the lawman it's the fact that they went and attacked their wives who were just at home you know doing whatever and he was just like i'm not about that he's like you know if it's two men that have a conflict and they're gonna fight you know i'm for it but when you start attacking innocent people I'm out. But but that's the thing. Michael Rooker has that arc of being like, oh, he was a bad guy, and now he's like, oh, he's a good guy on Whiteside. But we see him at the beginning, mm-hmm. like the, the pre-credit shootout yeah. at the church. At the church. And then we see him. The next scene he has is like an hour plus into the movie where he's like, I ain't about this life, Wyatt, here, and throws his sash down. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you were part of the Cowboys. Wait, yeah. What the fuck? It... it is so weird to me because like you have all these big actors who obviously probably had way bigger arcs when the story was going to be its three hour plus epic yeah that just got left on the cutting room floor 
Like, there's the whole thing with, like, Doc and Kate, and they have this really weird, toxic relationship, mm-hmm. and then Kate disappears yeah, well, halfway through the movie. We, you know, we get him you know, telling her, you know, we need to talk because he knows he's going soon. And then we don't see, you know, like, her packing up and leaving. We don't see the breakup. It's we, just... we see her giving him a blowy, like, after yeah. he's like, honey, I don't think I can live this hard life no more. And she's like, yes, you can. And he's like, oh. Ah, I know I love you, but you might be the Antichrist. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay. But it's it's so weird to me because I, I wanted to, you know, ask you this. Because the movie's 130 minutes long, yeah. right? So, and it, you know, you said it felt like it moved along pretty fast. And yeah. I said, eh, it feels like it drags a little bit. But I think this is true. Did it feel like there was stuff missing? Yes. Right? Yeah, you know, I mean... Uh, two hour ten minutes is a long time. Um, even if it's fastly paced, that's still you know a good amount of time. But I think it could have used an additional hour, or if they broke it up into two movies, maybe. Because well, it, it there's just so like... much there, and when it's you know actual historical people and things that have happened, it's like, yeah, you kind of can't you know cut corners. Like we want to know the entire story. Yeah, and the other thing is, it feels like they're setting up a lot of shit Mm -hmm. that's just never elaborated upon yeah like the whole thing with michael bean's character uh what is it johnny ringo yeah where he's built up as this badass gunslinger and he's gonna be like the real heavy the real villain of the piece right and i'm like okay he has like the scene where he can show he's twirling his gun really good Mm -hmm. he has the scene of being like I want your blood, herbs. I want your souls. And then, you know, Doc Holliday. He turns into a vampire. He turns into a vampire. And Doc Holliday's like, I'll be a huckleberry. And I'm like, iconic scene. Yes. It's happening, boys. Yes. And then after that, it's like, he kind of. Disappears. Disappears. Yeah. Like, Michael Bean's really good in this movie. I really like him. I forgot about him until they were after him. I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about you. And that's the thing. It's this giant, sprawling cast of real named actors given 100%. And they're all so hard to keep track of, and they're mm-hmm. all really hard to figure out. Like, why? Like, what is your arc supposed to be? Like, because the whole thing is like Michael Bean's supposed to be this like dark parallel of Doc Holiday, right? Yeah. And it feels like Doc Holiday is like the secret main character of the movie, but they're having Wyatt Earp be the main character because he's more of a the traditional like cowboy hero yeah. arc, and. I don't I don't know. It the movie feels like like awkward. It feels like somebody got a script that was 300 pages long, chopped that down to like 180 and then chopped another 50 out of it kind of thing. It feels yeah. like there's a lot of like scenes just missing. That's what I said. It, it probably could have stood, you know, to be either longer or two movies. Or, you know, turn it into a trilogy. You could honestly there's a there is a tight 90 minute movie in here somewhere. Mm-hmm. Like you could cut you could probably cut a good chunk of stuff like the, what is it, after they kill Michael Bean's character and they just go on another montage of killing people again. And I'm like, yeah, the, the, the montage is kind of through me because it's like, you know, it feels like this very rustic movie, you know, like we are, you know, boots on the ground and we are in Tombstone and we are walking through the streets. We are one of the people that lives there. And then we get this fancy montage of cool deaths. And I'm like. Like, that doesn't really go with the flow of the movie, but... Like, the movie's right. not cut fast enough to warrant there being a surprise, mo- like, gunfight montage. Or to expect it. Or there to be, like, three of them in quick succession. Yeah. It's it's fascinating to me, because, you know, the movie is, like, flawed in that way, but it still works. It is still so much fucking fun. Oh, yeah. Like, at, like there's so many great lines in the movie. Like, there's so many good just fun moments going on i think all the like kurt russell and Valcom are just like magnetic in the leads yeah and it's like it's it's fascinating to me because like right after this one of the the podcast favorite actors kevin costner released <laughs> wyatt earp which was the three hour sprawling epic wyatt earp movie that yeah. just bombed horribly and it's like from what i hear that movie's supposed to be like generally a more encompassing Wyatt Earp movie because it follows him as like a teenager to death and the whole nine yards right but no one likes that movie everyone likes Tombstone 
Yeah, and I mean, Tombstone has so much in it. I mean, I understand why they don't make Doc the the center of the movie because he dies at the end of the movie. Yes. And it's like, you want, you know, your hero to still be strong and, you know, to think, who else is he going to take down in this history up until he ends up dying in the 1920s, 1929? Yeah, the real Wyatt Earp dies in like, yeah, in 29 and like an, as an old, old man, which is an- another thing that makes the movie kind of feel different you know because it, this is the story of a, of one of those old west gunslingers that actually made it to old age most I mean, of them don't that and it's also kind of a, a mind fuck a little bit because you know he is a gunslinger you think of you know the okay corral uh boot hill cemetery and then you find out that Wyatt not only moves and lives away from that but he becomes a hollywood consultant on films yeah and it's just like it's like, you know, I know Hollywood, you know, the history of it is very vast. And he was there during, you know, he basically died the year the talkies yeah, took he was, over. He was like, yeah, when the talkies completely overran Hollywood, like but, when the last major studio took over. But it's such a, just, you know, a mind warp that it's like, no, you were in the Old West and, you know, gunslinging and then you came over to Hollywood and worked. It's like, what? It It is, it is really weird about that historical aspect of the movie that. You know, like it's the thing where people say that Cleopatra is closer to the invention of the iPhone than the building of the pyramids of Giza, which is just, like so weird yeah. to comprehend. And it's like Wyatt Earp was at the gun, you know, the gunfight at the OK Corral, and he also probably drove a Model T and got to see the jazz singer in theaters. And it's like that is weird to think about that he, because God, what is it? He was like in his seventies or some shit. Because this takes place in in uh, eighteen eighty something, right? Yeah, I think it was like eighteen eighty eight. I think I have it somewhere eighteen eighty two. Yeah, so yeah. it's like eighty two. So it's like that's so weird to think that he's still like, you know, the the movie ends and there's still like forty, fifty, sixty plus years left of life in the guy, and it feels like okay, like I like the ending where him and Jolene what? and Josephine, Josephine. Him and Josephine, you know, they dance in the in, in the, the snow. snow, and it's like, oh, we're gonna be together, you know. Oh yeah, you know, I love you, would love you, but it's like it feels like a weird ending, you know. Yeah, because I mean, you no, know, you you have him giving his old spiel to uh, Josephine, where he's like, you know, have you ever been at the top to- uh, top of the Rockies and look down and you see California, you know, that's true heaven, and then you find out that they lived and they were, you know, eventually buried in Colma, California. I had to Google it. It is right outside of San Francisco. And it's just mm. like, I'm like, so you guys came from Arizona, lived in California and Hollywood, and then lived and died in, near San Francisco. It's like, it's like, what? It It is one of those things where it's like, it's not the movie's fault, like at all. It's just because Wyatt Earp is a very um, atypical man of Western legend. And the, what the movie is doing is trying to truncate the most important or interesting bits of his life yeah. into being the OK Corral and his uh, crusade of revenge, right? I mean, that would have been cool if we kind of got like a singing in the rain kind of edge to the end of this movie where it's just an old Wyatt Earp walking on those sound stages, consulting and being like, you know what? I would do this differently with the guns. And it's just like... Okay, so this wow. this would have required... A true auteur, and it w- this it would have made the movie fail completely. So you make the movie <laughs> as this like black and white like western film that's kind of in the style of like a nineteen twenties you know like the Great Train Robbery or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the whole concept, you know, the end of the movie, it cut it, you know, it, the screen blacks out and it pulls out, and it's old ass Wyatt Earp being like, "Yeah, that's how it really <laughs> was." And you find out the narrator of the movie is just Wyatt Earp talking about like, yeah. You know, whatever. I'm like, that would have been really interesting. The movie would have failed completely. Oh, yeah. You make, but a, you make a 90s It still movie. would have been fun. It would have been fun. It would have been cool. But it would have, the movie would have failed completely. It's, I mean, you it's, know. It would have been so bad. I'm sitting there and I'm watching the movie, especially the, the scenes that we get where we're in the town. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I really want to go to Knott's right now. And I'm like, there's Boot Hill Cemetery. I'm like. How often do we walk through Boot Hill when we're walking, you know, around knots? It's just like looking at these little details and seeing, you know, the influence of history into something that, you know, 
thousands of people visit, you know, a day, a week, and walk through and not know that, you know, this was actually a living, breathing place. It's it's so interesting because that's not the movie influencing it. It's like the real thing. It's the history, yeah. It's... Yeah, and it's like... And that's the the thing, you know, the Western Western genres are very interesting because they take the history of the American West and with John Ford, it mythologized it. Mm-hmm. With Leone, he um, revised it. With Brooks, he parodied it. And with this, it's like retelling it. And it's, it's very interesting. But uh, I wanted to kind of round us back to talking about Tombstone, the actual movie. So... The movie itself is a product of this 1990s um, revival mm-hmm. of westerns, right? And we get Dancing with Wolves, Unforgiven, uh, Cooling Down Under, Flumstone Wild Herb, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Where do you think this falls in that 90s revival? Like, why do you think in the 1990s we had this string of westerns? And why do you think Tombstone kind of held on more because i don't think people go back and watch dances with wolves but people go back to watch tombstone i mean i know your dad loves dances with wolves i know no my dad uh i don't think my dad's ever seen dances with wolves actually are you sure because you tell me all the time oh yeah no, my no, dad no. watches it all the time no, no 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 my dad loves like like westerns but he likes clint eastwood westerns if if uh if it has clint eastwood in it in a cowboy hat my dad is there like outlaw josie wales i uh pale rider all those ones, yeah, my dad is there for those. Hang Em High is one of my dad's favorite movies. But I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, Westerns have been around for such a long time uh, before sound. They're arguably one of the oldest film genres. genres. Yeah. And I think it's a thing where, you know, we still had them in the 80s. They weren't prominent. And I think it's just, you know, it doesn't matter what decade it is. There's still that, you know that want and that need for westerns and i think that's why once we get into the 90s it's kind of like well this hasn't been done on a bigger scale in a long time let's see if we could do it again and with this movie it kind of feels like we have the avengers of the western world you have all these characters you know banding together they're these cool guys and the fact that these were actually real people i think that's what draws people into tombstone that is really an interesting take. It being kind of the the Avengers of westerns, you know, because it it feels like this movie has every, um, like basically every, maybe not lead a list leading man, but like a minus B plus leading man yeah. of the nineteen nineties you could have had, and like Ch- Charlton Heston shows up in this for like a walk on cameo, yeah. and it's like okay, so Tombstone. He's kind of like every Western trope, idea, actor kind of thrown in and being like, guys, we're just going to have fucking fun for two hours and uh, yeah, I hope you like it. Yeah. And I mean, and have it feel as authentic as possible where it's like you can't feel like, oh, you know, that's a sound stage. It's like, no, you feel like these guys are out in the middle of nowhere. And it's just like, you know, it gives you that feeling of how big the country must have felt back then and having to travel, you know, to start a new life in a new town and hope that things go well and it just falls apart. Is that the what is that the theme of the movie? Like you can't run away from your your, your past. De- your, well, not even past your destiny. Right. Like Wyatt Earp feels like he he was a lawman. He tried to run from it. And he it's, was the star of the show. He was. Yeah, he was the star of the show. And destiny is like, no, you you are you are a law man you can't run from it and yeah, it, it also I, feels like there's the difference between what's justice and revenge yeah. in this movie so and i mean the know. fact that you know him and his crew were able to take out all the cowboys and kind of end that gang of cowboys i mean it's kind of weird when you think cowboys are a gang he, yes that's like just think of you know the cool cowboys on the horse and they dress really nicely very nicely totally yes um, but yeah, uh, do you have anything else you want to talk about Tombstone? I mean, all my stuff is, you know, basically history and Val Kilmer, um, you know, little attentions to detail, like, uh, they even got, like, Doc Holliday's actual last words in this movie. They say, I'll be damned, and this is funny, 
because he dies without his boots on and that was something that he had said i guess throughout his life is you know I, i'm gonna die you know with my boots on well because he was like a gunslinger he yeah. always thought there he's like well i'm only gonna die getting shot in probably the back at a, a poker hall or something yeah like morgan which is again like i think that's just the thing that mystique of the western is just kind of oozing all over this because there's some badass things going on that are like no that that's real that, that yeah. that's just true which is like kind of just kind of cool i mean this is just a cool movie i don't know if it's a it's not it's not a masterpiece i don't think it's a a phenomenal film but it's really good it's really fun and it's really cool very cool very cool i mean even in the credits that's just that montage of them walking through the town it's so fucking ridiculous and I was like, uh, it is a mu- it is a music video basically at the end of just like okay guys look cool and just walk at the camera yeah we'll throw the slow-mo on yeah get get the fucking western guitar in yeah mm, and that's just the whole fucking credit scene it's ridiculous i think it worked i mean it's cool it's 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 lame and cool it that is mm, that is the credit scene ah well tombstone is what we have and tombstone is what we watched what did you think of tombstone i really enjoyed it um i'd watch it again Uh, i give it two thumbs up uh obviously there's things that i would change but i think as a whole it's a really good movie um i'm trying to think of all the other westerns from the 90s but yeah i i can see why this one sticks out as like you know the film yeah i i'd agree with you i think this is definitely the funnest one yeah it has probably the most cool stuff in it and there's a there's problems with it yeah honestly but i think there's the problems you can just gloss over and just ride the ride because the movie is again really fucking cool Mm -hmm. like i really dig it i don't think i like it as much as like an unforgiven because unforgiven is like a lot of is a lot deeper Mm -hmm. film and i don't think it's as weird or like um goofy as like a quigley down under which is uh i would say probably like a uh a more popcorny weird movie than this but i really like tombstone i would recommend it i think it is you know not a masterpiece but it's really really good and it also gives you fun behind the scenes stuff to look at and to learn about and it's so impressive that it came out as good as it did for all the problems it had yeah but i think since we're coming to an end of our western month we do have one more bonus that's coming out next week we do but uh i think we should do a roundup okay uh we're going back to the roundups i I think you know this one deserves a roundup this this month deserves a roundup and we both brought in you know some movies what was your favorite my favorite um because we watched stagecoach good and the bad and the ugly blazing saddles and Tombstone. tombstone i would say my favorite is probably good the bad and the ugly I, interesting you came in with the your favorite i did come in with my favorite out of the ones you suggested i think blazing saddles is like phenomenal yeah but good and the bad and the ugly i really really liked it i like that big sprawling epic nature i like the score i think is great mm-hmm. i think the the acting is so um I, I, i'm gonna say it iconic you know <laughs> and i i really dig what's going on there i like this unfolding story and narrative you know yeah but uh what about you i mean i was totally prepared that i was gonna stick with my blazing saddles because you know i love that movie so much then we watched stagecoach and i was kind of like you know i'm really digging this i'm really enjoying you know the old westerns and then we watched tombstone and you know val kilmer is amazing so i think i'm walking out of this with tombstone really oh yeah i mean val kilmer's performance is just top tier uh i have a ton of the gunslinger action that i enjoy i mean Mm -hmm. we see some gunslinging in this movie yeah but yeah you know this for me ended up being a, a favorite this month that's really cool honestly val kilmer has the best performance oh in the absolutely movie, in, hands of down. this month like it is real really true like watch the movie for that yes. honestly but yeah that's 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 awesome all right let's go tombstone but what are we watching next week next week we're rounding up western month with a movie we both haven't seen before yes we with a like, guest that we've had before who specializes in bringing us weird off the wall movies we've never heard of and they end up usually being pretty good that's right and we are going to be watching buck and the preacher 
starring and directed by Sydney Poitier. Yeah, I'm excited to watch this. I'm excited to talk about it. Um, what about you? I'm very excited. Uh, I've seen Poitier in In the Heat of the Night, and I really loved him there. And I'm really excited to see what he does as a director. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope we see Poitier as uh, as an auteur, right? Because yeah. the only Poitier film I've seen other than that is a uh, Ghost Dad. And this is 70s, I believe? Yeah, 72, I, okay. I think, is is the year this comes out. Like, yeah, because this is before uh, Blazing Saddles. Yes. Okay, so it's going to be interesting because, I mean, we kind of made a big deal about Blazing Saddles in the 70s. But we've got a film even earlier in the 70s, and it's, you know, a drama. Yes, and I'm curious if it's going to line up into the black exploitation genre, or if it's going to be played more like straight, like a prestige western. But after that, we're going into a new month. We are. And I mean, this is a, a theme that we came up pretty early when we were, you know, constructing the podcast. And I'm kind of excited to actually expand uh, expand it. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be doing Animation Month. Yes. No longer any May. We're doing Animation Month. So we're going to branch out from Japanese anime into doing American anime, any kind of anim- any animation kind, now. Yeah. Uh, and the first one we're going to watch is a Stone Cold Masterpiece. A classic. I mean... It's going to be a short episode, I ain't going to lie. Because there's not much to say about perfection. There isn't. And I mean, just on the, the tiers of, you know, film and, you know, history, this truly is a magnificent piece. It is Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. That's right. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island with a guest coming on, Alex Leto, who has lobbied that it is one of, if not the greatest film of all time and you're gonna have to listen to us and see if we agree or not but where can they go to do that if you want to listen to us on a different platform than you currently are you can find us on apple Podcasts, spotify google podcasts and youtube you can go to our youtube channel the film vault that is the film vault on youtube you can like comment subscribe and check out some of the video versions of this podcast and you can also follow us on social media at the Film Club Podcast on Instagram, where we post daily stories, upcoming episodes. If you want to listen to our episodes, you could actually go into our link in our bio, and it'll take you directly to our Spotify, our Apple Podcasts, and our YouTube page. And with that, we'll see you next week at the Film Club. Have a good week, everybody. 